All's fair in love and war. People are out here fighting each other with flaming pigs and the Exacto device. A toothbrush crossbow, talking laser, and microwave harassment. All right, before we get into this, there's a couple quick things I want to point out first. First of all, I mainly want to talk about what these weapons are, how they work, if they're any good, and I don't want to spend too much time covering the history of all of these weapons. If I was to cover the history of all of these weapons here, we would get bogged down really quick. And I want to keep this video moving pretty fast, so I'm mainly going to cover what the weapon is and how it worked. I might cover a little bit of history if it's necessary to understanding the weapon, or if it's just interesting or funny, but I mainly just want to talk about some strange weapons and tell you what they did. The other thing I'd like to point out about this iceberg chart is there are some entries on here that really seem to be coming out of left field. Like, for example, there's some entries on here like Jolly Ranchers or Dolphins, where you'd probably be like, that's not really a weapon. Look, these things are weapons. They should be on this iceberg. You just gotta let me explain, okay? And all this talk about weapons has me thinking about one of the best weapons you can use to defend your internet privacy. Of course, I'm talking about NordVPN, today's sponsor. Your internet service provider likely has records of all of your internet activity. And on top of that, bad actors can track you by monitoring your internet traffic. One of the best tools to protect your privacy from these groups is NordVPN. NordVPN encrypts your internet traffic and makes it so these groups can't track you. On top of that, NordVPN has also introduced a new feature on desktop called Threat protection. Threat protection will also help protect your computer from malicious websites, trackers, malware, and intrusive ads. Downloading and using NordVPN is also very straightforward. You simply download the app onto your Android, iPhone, Mac, or PC, launch the app, log in, and hit Quick Connect, and you will be automatically connected to a server that will encrypt your internet traffic and help keep your data safe. Near the release of this video, if you go to nordvpn.com slash parallel pipes, you can get a big discount off the two year plan with an additional four months for free. Or you could just go into the description of this video and click this link to get that deal. All right, now that we have that out of the way, let's get into it. Bat Bomb. The Bat Bomb was a weapon that was being developed by the United States during World War II, and it was intended to be used on Japan. Basically what this weapon was, was it was a large casing filled with thousands of tiny compartments, and each one of these compartments would have a hibernating Mexican free-tailed bat inside of it. Each one of these bats would have a small incendiary bomb attached to them, and the idea was this Bat Bomb would be deployed, and it would release all the bats on the target location, and the bats would fly around and roost in buildings and infrastructure of the target location, and eventually the timer on the incendiary bomb attached to the bats would go off and start fires all over the target location. Anywhere a bat went, a fire would probably start. The bat bomb was potentially a very destructive weapon. Development of this weapon ended up getting cancelled before it ever got to see deployment, and it's often believed that this weapon was cancelled because development wasn't moving fast enough, and development for the atomic bomb was moving along and it was going to be ready for deployment before this weapon in Japan, Operation Acoustic Kitty. So during the 1960s, according to some unclassified documents, the CIA ran a project called Acoustic Kitty. For this project, the CIA wanted to use cats to spy on Russians at Soviet embassies and the Kremlin, and what the CIA was specifically looking to do was take cats and surgically implant microphones and radio transmitters into them, and they would release these cats on a target location, and then ideally the cat would be able to get up close to the target, and then the CIA would be able to tune in to the implanted microphones on the cat, and then they'd be able to eavesdrop in on some conversations at the target location. And even if someone ended up spotting this cat, they'd just think it's a regular cat and be none the wiser. Reportedly, this project wasn't very successful. Unclassified documents by the CIA say that during the first test of one of these microphone cats, the cat ended up wandering off and got hit by a taxi. When the CIA closed this project, they cited it as a failure due to the fact that cats are really unpredictable and are very hard to train. The Krumlauf. So the STG-44 is an assault rifle that was widely used by Germany in World War II, and at one point they made an attachment for this weapon called the Krumlauf that did this to it. The Krumlauf effectively gave the STG a curved barrel. The idea was this attachment would allow soldiers to shoot around corners from a safer position. Although these were never very widely produced and they were never really used that much, they did surprise work as intended, although they would usually break after a couple hundred uses. Bouncing Bomb. This entry is referring to how, during World War II, the British developed a weapon called the Upkeep Bouncing Bomb. This was a cylindrical-shaped bomb that would be dropped out of a plane 
bounce across the water and then hit a target. You might be thinking to yourself, okay, what's the benefit of a bouncing bomb when other water-based weapons exist, like torpedoes? And the benefit of a bouncing bomb is, for example, during World War II, sometimes dams were protected with anti-torpedo nets, and torpedoes would usually get stuck in these, but a bouncing bomb could just come along and bounce over these nets and hit the target. On one specific occasion, the British actually managed to fly behind German enemy lines and blow up two dams with bouncing bombs. Helmet gun. So this entry is referring to how, back in 1916, a man by the name of Albert Pratt made a design for a helmet gun. This weapon is exactly what it sounds like. It was basically a helmet that would have a gun fitted inside of it. To fire this gun that was inside the helmet, there would be a tube that would come out of the helmet and down to the wearer's mouth, and if you were to blow on this tube, it would fire the helmet gun. Unfortunately, this weapon never was actually built. Only Albert Pratt's unused patent for this weapon exists. You might be wondering, what's the point of having a helmet gun when I could just have a regular gun? Well, the patent for this weapon would have an answer for your question. The patent specifically claims that a helmet gun would be beneficial because when soldiers are on the battlefield, they subconsciously look at enemies and targets on the battlefield, and so a helmet gun that aims everywhere you look would help you hit opponents more effectively and have a better reaction time. Of course, the technology within this weapon has remained unproven. Kill Dozer. Alright, so for this one, we're gonna need a little bit of background information. So where you could say this story starts is, there was this guy by the name of Marvin Hemeyer who, in 1992, through an auction, bought a piece of land in Green. Granby, Colorado. He did end up opening up a muffler shop on this land, and it turned out to be pretty successful. Despite his business's success, though, he was constantly at odds with the locals and government in Granby. We're not going to get into the details of what drove Marvin Hemeyer to do what he did, because it's pretty complicated and it would take a lot of time to do the story justice. But basically, Marvin Hemeyer ended up getting in a lot of disputes with town locals and the city government, and with these people that wanted to build a concrete plant next to his business. The construction of this said concrete plant, plus some things involving the city government, ultimately led Marvin to decide to shut down his muffler business. And all these things kind of culminated together to push Marvin Hemeyer to want to seek revenge on the city of Granby. To get revenge, he constructed a weapon that is often referred to as the Killdozer. So what this guy did was he took a bulldozer and installed concrete and steel plating on it to act as armor. His armor was as much as a foot thick in some places. He installed a bunch of guns on the vehicle, and he installed cameras on the outside of the vehicle that would be connected to some monitors inside of the cabin so he could get a good view of where he was driving. There are elements of this weapon's design too that are very thoughtful. He installed compressed air nozzles onto the cameras that could be used to blow dust and debris off of the cameras, and he also installed an air conditioner and fans inside of the cabin to keep the operator cool under all of the armor. On June 4th of 2004, he decided to use his weapon to seek revenge on the people of Granby that he felt had wronged him, and much of it was broadcast on live television. He bulldozed the neighboring concrete plant, a local newspaper office, the home of a former mayor, and the town hall. He caused an estimated $7 million in damages. The weapon was pretty much impenetrable to gunfire, and any obstacles that people tried throwing in front of it, the bulldozer just plowed through them. This thing's rampage was only stopped when one of the treads got stuck in the basement of a building it was trying to bulldoze. Shortly after this machine got stuck, Marvin Hemeyer took his own life while inside of it. Jolly Ranchers. So so there's a couple different ways you could look at this entry, but what I think this entry is most likely referring to is you can pretty easily make a shiv out of Jolly Ranchers. While looking into this, I've seen some sources that say that some prisons have had to ban Jolly Ranchers and just hard candies in general because prison inmates were taking these hard candies, melting them down, and making shivs out of them. Bob Semple Tank. It's World War II. New Zealand is concerned that they might have to defend themselves from a Japanese invasion. And so New Zealand's Minister of Works, Bob Semple is tasked with designing a tank to help defend New Zealand. And so what does he come up with? A weapon that is now referred to as the Bob Semple tank. It is now often regarded as one of the worst tanks ever. So how was this tank built, you may ask? So during World War II, New Zealand didn't really have the infrastructure to build a completely unique tank. And so they had to get a little bit resourceful on how they were gonna build tanks. And so Bob Semple and his team came up with a plan to build tanks. What they were gonna do was take a tractor that was was built in the United States called the Caterpillar D8 and basically put armor plating and guns on it. New Zealand had about a hundred of these tractors available on the island at the time and since they were kind of in a pinch here, perhaps they could transform these tractors into somewhat adequate tanks. In the end, this design did not pan out very well. The tank was really slow, the armor plating that they put on it was too heavy for the tractor bay.
base, the tank literally had to stop to change gears, and if this tank ever had to go out into battle, it would be blown out of the water by its opponents. When New Zealand decided to show off this tank to the public, it was widely ridiculed. Russian Tsar tank. So, the Russian Tsar tank is referring to a tank of sorts that underwent development by the Russians during World War I. This is what it looked like, and as you can see, it took a very different form factor from many of the tanks of the time. The front wheels were 30 feet in diameter, whilst the back wheels were only 5 feet. The vehicle looks this way because ideally this design would allow it to travel through rough terrain. One of these actually was built by the Russians during World War I, but during its very first test run, the back wheel got stuck in the mud and they were just completely unable to pull it out. The tank ended up being so heavy that they were just incapable of pulling it out of the mud. So let me give you a quick rundown on what the life of this tank was. A model of this tank was built in 1914. It got stuck in the mud on its very first test run, and it just sat there stuck until 1923, until reports say it was dismantled for scrap. Flaming pigs. So before we talk about flaming pigs, we need to understand war elephants. There are quite a few examples of soldiers mounting elephants and riding them into battle during invasions, and in some circumstances, war elephants proved to be pretty effective weapons. And so this led to people having to develop methods to fight elephants. Well, it turns out one of the best techniques to defend against war elephants isn't to necessarily try and attack them and kill them. Instead, oftentimes it's more effective to just try and spook the war elephants to the point where they're no longer an effective weapon for your enemies, and the now spooked war elephants sow chaos into the enemy's ranks. And so this leads us to the concept of flaming pigs. There are a couple different examples of people using flaming pigs to try and spook war elephants. For example, in 266 BC, the Macedonian ruler Antonogus Gennatus was looking to siege the city of Megara, and this siege employed the use of war elephants, and documents related to this situation say that defenders of Megara rounded up pigs and doused them in a combustible pitch and set them on fire and unleashed them onto enemy ranks. Documents say that these flaming pigs were way too much for the war elephants to handle, and it caused a lot of the elephants to get spooked and panic, and the soldiers would lose control of their elephants, and the elephants would end up trampling their own soldiers to death. Toothbrush crossbow. So in Manitoba, Canada, there is a jail there called Stony Mountain Institution, and one day in 1998, the prison guards there were doing a cell check, and in one of the prisoner's cells, they found a very interesting weapon. They found a crossbow that was very creatively made. This crossbow was made out of 10 toothbrushes, a cigarette lighter, a section of a ballpoint pen casing, a piece of a wire coat hanger, a section of a pair of aluminum cafeteria tongs, a yellow rubber glove, some Kleenex, some string, and a few screws. The bolts that this thing was supposed to fire were made of tightly packed toilet paper and aluminum foil. Apparently, the prison guards, instead of just throwing this thing away immediately, tested it out and reportedly it could fire up to 40 feet. Instead of throwing this thing away, it's now on display at the Kingston Penitentiary Museum in Ontario. Flying Laser. This entry is likely referring to the Boeing YAL-1. This is a weapon system that basically took a Boeing 747 and mounted a big-ass laser on it. It was designed by the United States military to be used as a defense system against enemy ballistic missiles. This is an infrared laser, so you can't see the laser itself with the naked eye. This is a big oversimplification of what the plane did, but ultimately what would happen is the plane would shoot a laser at a missile, and the laser would heat up the exterior of the missile and weaken its structural integrity, and eventually the missile would crumble midair. The project was eventually cancelled in 2011, and it seems like there's quite a few reasons for this happening, but when the US government talks about why they shut down this project, the reason for why they shut down this project are usually that the laser wasn't quite powerful enough for the weapon system to be practical, and the project as a whole wasn't very cost efficient. Vespa 150 Tap. The Vespa 150 Tap is referring to this thing right here. Most sources refer to it as a anti-tank scooter, and it was built by the French in the 1950s. So yeah, you know, this scooter had a M20 75mm recoilless rifle mounted on it. This rifle could fire smoke, high explosive, and anti-tank rounds. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, the gun wasn't intended to be fired while the scooter was moving. You were actually supposed to take the gun off of the scooter and mount it on a separate tripod. However, the dream isn't completely dead, because many sources are quick to point out that, quote, in an emergency, it could be fired while in the frame and while the scooter was moving. Woomera. A Woomera is a weapon that's used by Australian aboriginals. The Woomera is effectively a stick with a peg on the end of it that you can mount a spear onto, and it will allow you to pack more energy into your spear throw. It's essentially the Australian version of an atlatl, if you're familiar
familiar with one of those things, double-barreled cannon. So double-barreled cannon could be referring to a couple different things, but I think this is referring to a double-barreled cannon that was invented by a man by the name of John Gilliland during the American Civil War. This weapon is kind of exactly what the name suggests it is. It's a cannon, but with two barrels. The creator pitched it to a bunch of different Confederate leaders, but no one wanted to actually use it in war. There is one part of this weapon, though, that I think is kind of funny. This weapon would shoot two cannonballs at once, and these two cannonballs would be connected in the middle by a metal chain. And some documents that speak of this weapon say that these two cannonballs connected by a metal chain were supposed to mow down the enemy somewhat as a scythe cuts wheat. So it seems like this weapon was supposed to fire two cannonballs connected by a metal chain, and they would fly through the field of battle and clothesline enemy soldiers. Bog knock. This is a weapon you're supposed to fit over your knuckles, and you can conceal it in your palm, and so it would make a good weapon for sneak attack. You're kind of supposed to claw into people with this one, the Exacto device. The Exacto device is kind of an insane weapon that was being developed by DARPA. DARPA is a group that develops new weapon technologies for the United States. The Exacto device is a guided bullet. It's a bullet that can change its trajectory mid-air and track down a target and hit it. In 2014, DARPA released footage of the Exacto device being operational, and the footage literally shows a sniper shooting off target and then the bullet correcting itself mid-flight and then hitting the target. Although nobody on the outside really seems to know exactly how this weapon works, it appears that this bullet has fins on it that allow it to change its trajectory mid-air, and there's also a system of cameras that can monitor the bullet's trajectory and tell it where to go. The Davy Crockett. So this entry is referring to this thing. That's a nuclear bomb. Like, that's a nuclear warhead. The Davy Crockett is often referred to as one of the smallest nuclear weapon systems ever built. This weapon system could literally be carried in with, like, a truck or in some backpacks, and some variants of this weapon could shoot a nuclear bomb up to 2.5 miles. This weapon was developed by the United States during the Cold War, and they were looking to use this weapon to defend against a possible Soviet invasion over in Europe. The nuclear bomb that this thing could deliver only had a yield of about 10 to 20 tons of TNT, which is pretty small considering that the nuke dropped on Nagasaki had an explosive yield of 20,000 tons of TNT, so this bomb was about a thousand times smaller. Although I think it's pretty funny that the Wikipedia page for this weapon says that it has a 100% instant casualty radius in excess of 160 meters. A-40 flying tank. It's World War II. The Russians are getting creative again. I'll cut to the chase, they built a flying tank. Unfortunately, there isn't any video footage of this thing actually flying, but there is this picture which, holy shit. The way that they made this thing was they took a tank that they already had, the T-60, a tank that was relatively lightweight in terms of tanks, and they strapped wooden fabric biplane wings to it to allow the tank to act as a glider. The way this thing worked is they would tow it into the sky with a bomber plane, and then the plane would let go of the tank and it would glide into battle. Once the tank landed, it could drop its wings and just act as a regular tank. Apparently during the first test flight of this thing, the airplane was barely strong enough to get it up into the sky, and the flying tank also had to kind of make a crash landing, so they ended up dropping this design after that. The Schwerer Gustav. The Schwerer Gustav is a railway gun, and it is often referred to as the biggest gun ever used in battle. It was developed by the Germans in World War II. This gun was so big that to move it really long distances, it would have to be dismantled, transported by train, and then reassembled at the attack location. The other thing about this gun is that for it to move at its attack location, you would have to build specific tracks just for it. In addition to that, you'd also have to lay down an extra layer of tracks for some cranes that would be used to assemble the gun. And so to get this gun going, you'd have to lay down some tracks for the gun, lay down some tracks to assemble the gun, and then you could start building the gun. But once this gun was juiced up and ready to go, it was actually very powerful. It could shoot shells up to a weight of 7 tons and a range of up to 29 miles. The reload time on this thing was so slow though, they could only shoot 14 shells per day, and they would have to replace the barrel after firing around 300 shells. On the eastern front, this gun did see some action and it took out a number of ammunition dumps and Soviet fortresses. But as Germany started to fall, they destroyed this gun to make sure it didn't fall into enemy hands. So cool. Google Panzer. The Google Panzer is referring to this thing. People refer to it as a tank, and the only still existing model of it, and likely the only existing model of it ever, is currently sitting at a tank museum in Moscow. Supposedly, it's never been examined by any experts outside of Russia, and so there just isn't a whole lot of detailed information on it. What is generally believed to be known about it, though, is that it was built by Germany in the lead-up or during World War II. At some point, it was shipped over to Japan for whatever reason, and from there, down the line, it eventually found itself in Manchuria, and in 
1945, it was captured by Soviet troops, and now it's in this tank museum. Beyond that, there really isn't a whole lot that is certain about this vehicle. People generally believe it was supposed to be a scout vehicle, or a cable layer, or maybe an artillery spotter. Some people have proposed the theory that maybe it was supposed to be used as a kamikaze vehicle, and I've seen people on the internet who think this weapon is so incredibly impractical in every way that they think it's a hoax, or there are falsehoods in the story surrounding it. Talking laser. So in 2019, the US military revealed that they were working on a very interesting non-lethal weapon. This weapon is often referred to as the talking laser. So basically what this weapon is, is it's a laser that can create a plasma ball on the end that can emit sounds. In short, the way this weapon works is one laser will fire and create a ball of plasma on the end, and then a second laser will fire and hit this ball of plasma. And when this laser hits this ball of plasma, it can make it vibrate, and these vibrations can emit sound. And if manipulated properly, it can make sounds that mimic human speech. Unfortunately, there aren't a lot of available examples of what the talking laser sounds like. There is a video by the Military Times that does feature audio of what the talking laser sounds like, but they also decided to add some reality TV show-ass background music, so you're gonna have to deal with that. It and actually make human voice sounds and commands. Stop! Now, where this the US military says this weapon has a couple different applications. Of course, this weapon could be used to communicate or give directions over long distances. But the US military also says that they can make this plasma ball emit incredibly loud sounds, like upwards of 155 decibels. For reference, 85 decibels is enough to cause hearing damage, and these loud sounds could stun or incapacitate an opponent. There hasn't been a lot of information released on this weapon since 2019, but it's believed that US forces will implement it at some point, our wall tusk. So what I believe this entry is referring to is in 2019, a man by the name of Usman Khan showed up to an event at Fishmonger's Hall in London armed with two knives. He stabbed and killed two people at this event, a woman by the name of Saskia Jones and a man by the name of Jack Merritt. Following this stabbing, Usman Khan was chased out of the building. One of these guys that chased Usman Khan out, a guy by the name of Darren Frost, grabbed a decorative narwhal tusk off of the wall and started using using it as a weapon to fight Usman Khan. Also, one of the other guys grabbed a fire extinguisher and started spraying him with it too. These men, armed with a narwhal tusk and fire extinguisher, kept this guy occupied until police showed up and ended up killing Usman Khan. Dolphins. So there are a surprising amount of circumstances where dolphins have been used as a kind of weapon. In fact, starting in 1960, the US Navy started a marine mammal program where they used dolphins for a number of different tasks. And this project remained classified until 19. 1992. Since this project started, the United States has trained dolphins to bring supplies to divers. They've trained dolphins to do underwater patrol and search for enemy divers and vessels. They've even trained dolphins to detect underwater mines. And on top of that, it's even been rumored that the United States has, in the past, outfitted dolphins with a deadly weapon. Seemingly, there are reports from former U.S. Navy dolphin trainers that claim that, at points, the U.S. Navy was outfitting dolphins with a weapon that was basically a CO2 can canister that was attached to a hypodermic needle on the nose of the dolphin, and the idea was that dolphins would be trained to stab this hypodermic needle into an opponent and inject them with CO2, and this CO2 injection would basically cause the opponent to explode underwater. Of course, the US Navy has claimed that they have never used dolphins to kill people. It should be noted that there are other reports, though, that suggest that other countries beyond the United States have employed killer dolphins. Interestingly, an example of military killer dolphins came up back in 2020. In a video released by Hamas, a spokesperson claimed that a member of Hamas was doing a water-based operation of some sort and was killed by a dolphin. This dolphin was supposedly carrying this weapon on it, although it seems as though there is no explanation given on how this weapon shown here works and if it was a CO2 injector or maybe some other kind of weapon. And Hamas claims that Israel is responsible for this killer dolphin. It seems that some are open to the possibility of this being legitimate, although many also believe that this may be Hamas just trying to do some propaganda work and this killer dolphin situation is fake. Yeah, this entry. So in 1994, the Wright Laboratory, which is a predecessor of today's United States Air Force Research Laboratory, made a three-page proposal for a variety of different non-lethal chemical weapons that they could possibly work on and pursue. They pitched these non-lethal chemical weapons to the United States Department of Defense, and amongst these different proposals for chemical weapons, there was this thing. I'll just read 
you what it says. This specific proposal suggests creating chemicals that affect human behavior so that discipline and morale in enemy units is adversely affected. One distasteful but completely non-lethal example would be strong aphrodisiacs, especially if the chemical also caused homosexual behavior. Another example would be a chemical that made personnel very sensitive to sunlight. This is what this entry is referring to. A spokesperson for the Pentagon has gone on record saying that they never actually ended up developing this weapon. Key gun. So key guns are basically keys that have been outfitted with a gun. Although these don't really exist anymore, back in the day, a single person at a jailhouse would have had to been able to put a prisoner behind bars and lock the door at the same time. So thus the key gun was born. Now you can both lock the door and shoot with just one hand. Microwave harassment. So in 2016, there were numerous U.S. diplomats who were stationed in the capital of Cuba, Havana, and many of these personnel worked for the U.S. Embassy there. And while staying at homes and hotels in Havana, Cuba, many of these U.S. personnel reported experiencing a very strange sensation that led to sudden and debilitating symptoms. More specifically, many U.S. personnel at some point reported hearing a high-pitched screeching or chirping sound, pretty much out of nowhere. As they were hearing this high-pitched sound, they would start experiencing a variety of different symptoms, such as headaches, nausea, vertigo, a feeling of pressure in their head, and even after this high-pitched screeching sound disappeared, many of the U.S. personnel would be left with long-term health effects. Following this sensation, many U.S. personnel were left with long-term cognitive difficulties, headaches, tinnitus, hearing problems, and the list goes on. After this situation, more U.S. intelligence and military personnel started reporting symptoms similar cases all over the world, places such as India, China, Russia, and many European countries. Since these cases started taking place, many different theories had been put forward that could maybe explain what was causing these situations. It was put forth that maybe these people were exposed to pesticides, or maybe these people were falling victim to some kind of mass hysteria, or maybe these US personnel were just under a lot of stress, and this stress is to blame for these symptoms. Basically, there were a lot of explanations for this situation that were put forth that don't suggest foul play. However, it was also put forth that these people were perhaps exposed to some sort of electromagnetic weapon and someone or some group was aiming radio or microwaves at them without them knowing. Now, this whole thing started back in 2016 and till this day, there are still a lot of questions that remain. But in 2022, the US government issued some reports that give us a little bit more insight as to what they think is going on. Based on the US government's reports, it seems as though they believe that the majority of these Havana Syndrome cases can be explained by natural causes. Like there was no foul play here, and people fell sick to more natural and known causes such as stress or pesticides or mass hysteria. However, it is also reported that a small subset of these cases cannot be explained by known environmental or medical conditions, and there might be something else at play here. This document released by the US government in February of 2022 refers to Havana Syndrome cases as anomalous health incidents, or AHIs, and this document says a subset of AHIs cannot be easily explained by known environmental or medical conditions and could be due to external stimuli. Pulsed electromagnetic energy, particularly in the radio frequency range, plausibly explains the core characteristics of reported AHIs, although information gaps exist. Ultrasound also plausibly explains the core characteristics, but only only in close access scenarios and with information gaps. Psychosocial factors alone cannot account for the core characteristics, although they may cause some other incidents or contribute to long-term symptoms. So basically what this document is saying is that a pulsed electromagnetic weapon that might shoot radio or microwaves might be to blame for some of these Havana Syndrome cases. So maybe some group or foreign government had access to some sort of electromagnetic weapon and was shooting it at US personnel with Without them knowing and causing some pretty serious damage to their brains. It should be noted though that the US government till this day has never officially accused any foreign government or any group of shooting some sort of electromagnetic weapon at United States personnel. Well that was the Ridiculous Weapons Iceberg, I hope you enjoyed it. Why don't you check out the Parallel Pipes official Discord server, you don't want to miss it. Also while you're at it, why don't you check out the new Parallel Pipes Instagram. Anyway guys, see you next time.